Welcome everyone. It's Wednesday, March 28th, and um, this is the Aperio Analytics Lightning Talks. My name is Neil Caden uh, with, with the Aperio Foundation, and I'm really thrilled to have several presenters from our community to talk about their work in analytics and um, time permitting, we may also have a little bit of a community discussion because there was a lot of interest uh, among the analytics folks on finding out what other people in the community, what other institutions in the community are doing with analytics or what you're hoping to do or what direction you're considering. So that would, my, if we have time, we'll, we'll work on that as well. Um, the format for today is Lightning Talks format. So they're very short presentations. Each presenter, we have presentations from Siath Lamp and Marist College and Notre Dame. And um, each, present, each presenter or um, group of presenters from their institution will have 10 minutes, I'll time it. I'll, in the chat, let them know when there's um, like uh, two minutes left and one minute left. And then we'll have uh, five minutes for uh, questions and answers. And from experience, I know in these lightning talks, sometimes we have more questions than we're able to handle in the time allotted. Sometimes we don't have any questions for whatever reason. So we'll just kind of play that by ear and see how that works. And uh, with no further ado, we've decided on an order that everyone felt comfortable with. So um, I would like to bring up the first set of slides, which is for LAMP. Let's show that. And then Martin, I'm going to give you presenter permissions. And whenever you start, I'll start the timer over here. Let's see. OK. You should be able to uh, start whenever it feels right to you. <laughs> and I guess it feels right. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Um, and thanks, Neil, for, for organizing this, as you do so often with these, these nice lightning talks. I'm here to talk about um, something that we have done in the LAMP consortium called Soleil. I'll, I'll tell you what that is in just a second. But before I get into that, it would make sense, I think, to give you just a, a quick thumbnail sketch for those of you who are not aware of what we are, uh, because we're a little bit unique in that we are a community of 19 colleges and universities that share a single instance of Sakai. So that makes us a multi-tenant instance, which has its own, shall we say, challenges. Um, the consortium, the LAMP consortium provides hosting and support and training. And we have, by the way, a summer conference and you're all invited to attend. In fact, um, I'm putting the URL uh, in the chat um, for the summer conference so you can go take a look at it. We would love to have you, love to have you come and, and be a part of that. Uh, but we're basically this, this group that shares a single instance of Sakai so that we can reduce costs as well as provide support to each other. Um, and, and so it's in that context that I'm going to talk about what we're doing with analytics, um, just to give you sort of a rough idea. I, in, in my mind, at least, there are sort of um, some different ways of looking at analytics. One is kind of thinking about uh, what has happened in the past. And so I, I tend to think of that as an audit where you look back and say, you know, what happened? Um, frankly, a, a post-course evaluation kind of is, is in that category. You know, the course is already over. How do we do? How did the professor do? Um, th those are easier to do. I don't mean that they're easy, but they're easier than an assessment, which sort of looks at what's going on right now. That's where I'm going to focus today. And where we're not focusing yet, although we would like to head this way, is to look towards the future to do some predictive analytics. Um, but right now, we're going to focus on, on an assessment. Basically, how are we doing right now? The idea is that um, we, we would like to be able to establish how well the professor is engaging with their students. So our focus, I should say this, our focus is, is on the faculty uh, rather than on the, um, uh, on the students. Uh, other people are working on student engagement, but we're working on faculty engagement. And we're, we're basically, we've, we've built a system that, that runs um, every week so that we can, even while a course is going on, so it's in the middle of the course, we can check and see how well uh, the, the professor is engaging with the students um, in, in this course. And so we've built this system that we call Soleil, Supporting Online Engagement. And it runs external to Sakai, but it pulls data from the Sakai um, uh, two tables, which I'll talk about just in just a minute here, um, and a, an analytics engine so that it can provide a, a web-based dashboard to the instructor as the course is going on, um, sort of telling them how well they're doing in terms of engaging with the students. It also sends an email containing that dashboard on a weekly basis. Um, and uh, can also go to key administrators, for example, the dean, if that's, uh, that's appropriate. Um, so that's just kind of a rough idea of, of what it is. I'll show you a little bit of a schematic 
or how it looks. Um, in, in Sakai, uh, there are these two tables. One is the sessions table, one is the events table. Many of you are probably familiar with this. A session happens when a, when a, a user logs in, um, tells you who is doing it and when they're doing it. And then the events table tells you what they did, where they do it, how they do it. Um, and, and you get an entry for that for almost every, not every, but almost every event that happens within Sakai. And so um, what, we, what we have done is we have taken that data using this analytics engine and generated this web-based dashboard uh, and this, this email dashboard. And so that's essentially what Soleil is. It's outside of Sakai, but it's pulling from these two, uh, these two tables in Sakai. So this is what it looks like. Um, I can blow that up a little bit if you'd like to see it. Um, and maybe I'll focus over on this side here. Uh, there are four categories for engagement. There's sort of what we call overall engagement. Then there's the email responsiveness engagement. Our thinking is that if a student emails uh, the professor, and of course this has to be done within Sakai, so we can talk about that, um, then we want the professor to be responsive to that email. We are also, we know that um, discussions are very important, and so we want the, the professor to be engaged in, in discussion forums as a part of the class. And then finally, when an assignment is made and a student turns it in, we want the grading of that assignment to be responsive as well. So those are the four categories. Um, and I'll blow this back out so that you can sort of see, you know, here's each of the professors, here's the course. This would be a screen that a dean would see. So these are the courses that the dean is measuring. And, and this is the, the um, the, the values or the report card for one week. Blue means meets the standard, uh, yellow means not quite, and red means no, you're, you're below where the standard, uh, where we expect the, the standard to be. Let me also say that when you look at this online, you can hover over any of these. Again, I'll blow this up. Um, and I see I'm getting a question here. Um, and, and so this, this yellow dot, for example, you know, doesn't quite meet the standard. Well, what happened? Well, they didn't log on on Sunday. They did once on Monday, none on Tuesday, twice on Wednesday, none on Thursday, once on Friday, none on Saturday. And our standard is that for this particular uh, report card is that it has to be done at least five days a week. So uh, we're, we're missing a day. And that, that sort of shows a pattern of close, but not quite um, in terms of what kind of engagement the professor has. We also, if we're looking at, for example, this email one, what's going on there? Well, there were 13 emails written by students and the professor responded to eight of them. OK, that doesn't meet the standard. We're looking for a higher uh, rate than that. And so uh, that's the reason that that one is read. And I can talk a little bit about some of the, um, the challenges with the, uh, the, let's see, not the session table, it's the event table um, as to why it's a little difficult to measure this. You know, that's, that's one of the challenges that we've had. Thank you, Neil, for the halfway point in, uh, note. Um, and so, oh, let me also just say that um, each each school can set what those thresholds are. So, for example, how many times do they check in? Um, we're looking for five days to get a green dot. If it's three or better, we'll get a yellow dot. If it's less than three, we'll get a red dot. So we can we can set those. That's set uh, something that could be set by each individual uh, school. So that's kind of I realized I'm probably I was that was faster than I thought, Neil. So let me take a, a couple of these questions here. Uh, Josh said, uh, how would a faculty member be green for overall assessment, but red and yellow for other measures? Um, good question. Let me go back a slide here and say that there, there are four measurements. And so on this screen here, you can see there are four setups. This screen is what we call overall engagement. And now I'm going to be real, real frank and say that that is essentially how many times did you log into Sakai uh, during the week? Um, that's what we're measuring. And so you may have logged in only on Monday, Josh, and done a whole bunch of work and then not logged into the rest of the week. Well, um, that means that you could, uh, you, you, you didn't meet the logging in standard, but you did meet perhaps some of the other standards. On the other hand, and I think this is your question here, um, they, in terms of, they logged in every day of the week but they didn't get into the discussion forum. They didn't respond to emails. They didn't um, grade assignments promptly. And so they got uh, less than green dots on those particular metrics. So it can go either way. Um, and, and, and no, uh, your second question, you're assuming that the three submeasures roll up into the overall measure. No, that's not the case. Um, they are four independent metrics, but they measure different things. One is basically how often do you engage with Sakai? How quickly do you respond to emails? How um, how often do you engage in discussion forums and how quickly do you grade uh, assignments? So there, there are four distinct metrics. Um, but 
I, I think maybe the overall point for this particular talk is there's a wealth of information inside these uh, sessions and events files within Sakai that can be mined. And this is one way of sort of uh, mining that data and showing it with a particular focus on current uh, courses and instructor engagement as opposed to student engagement and as opposed to after the fact kind of thing. So um, Sam says, uh, how have faculty responded to being measured in this way? Have you seen an increase in instructor engagement after launching this project? Uh, excellent question. I'm not sure that I can answer that uh, with any great assurity yet. Um, I think some faculty are not crazy about it. Um, uh, it's, it's, I, I think the uptake has been um, not as strong as we would have liked. Um, and it's more, even though we've been doing this, goodness, for a year and a half now, maybe even longer than that, um, I, I still feel like it's sort of being um, used as more of a demonstration. This is what we could do to, to check this sort of thing. Um, and I think it's probably being used more by deans who are saying, uh, hey, Dr. Smith, um, you realize your students are probably kind of expecting you to be online more often than you are. Do you think you could do something about that? So, uh, Neil, I think I'm about out of time. Yep, I got 45 seconds according to my clock. So maybe I'll turn it back over to you and say what questions, other questions do people have? Right, I think, Martin, since you started answering questions, right, you, your presentation piece is almost done, but we also allocated some additional time for questions. So um, I think we've got to, I'm going to restart the timer and uh, for five minutes, and so we can go a few more minutes to discuss this. Yeah, this, what other questions do people have that uh, we need to take a look at or, or pay attention to? I've got some. Uh, I've got some other slides that I could show you. For example, um, uh, let's see here. There is we, a we, there is a question in the, that oh, came sorry. in by the way. Francois, um, what technologies were used for the development of the analytics engine? Well, we. Uh, yep, and I hear the timer. <laughs> um, we. Um, a couple of things. One is digging into. I, we we parse. Let me just say this. In fact, let me. I'll bring up a picture of this here. Um, Here's, here's the session data. This is what that, uh, that looks like. Um, it's, it's a pretty, you know, it's, this is just a big hairy file. We parse about 1.4 million records every week. So it's a fairly, it's, it's a fairly lengthy process. And we use some, I, I use a particular programming language that I like very much. It's called FileMaker to develop this. Um, that's probably not real important to this, but it basically has to be able to dig into, burrow into the uh, session file and the events file and extract what it needs to be able to build these sort of things. And it's uh, it's a little bit hairy. So Dave says, can you speak to how the Sakai events, Sakai sessions are being managed, harvested daily, multiple times a day, etc.? cetera? Um, what I do, it's a good question, Dave. What I do is once a week, um, I, I dig into those. Um, I basically carve out only the data for the, the past week um, because it becomes unmanageable. And that's still, even that is 1.4 million records. Typically on a typical week, it's 1.4 million records. Um, and then into that, we have to basically only pull out the data that's pertinent to the courses and the professors that we're actually monitoring. We're not monitoring everybody across 19 institutions. That's too much. Uh, but we are monitoring the ones that our, our member schools who are doing this say that they want to monitor. Um, so at, basically we're harvesting it once a week and we're harvesting you know just that week's data and then we pull out from that the data that we we need other questions i will say that this may be oh i'm sorry go ahead no uh th this is this is from the sakai um the um confluence site uh, for those of you who don't who aren't aware of this, there is an event code dictionary, what, what I call the event code dictionary, that essentially gives you all the events and essentially what uh, what happens or where they come from within Sakai. One of the one of the downsides, if I can grumble a little bit, is that not every tool uh, logs the events that you wish they would, and so there are some tools that are conspicuous by their absence from this event code table. Um, and secondly. Um, there are cases where I would really love it if the event code would, would indicate, let me give you an example, the professor responds to an email from a student. I don't know from the event code uh, table which email they're responding to. I just know that they responded. I'd love it if I could be able to say, you know, there were eight emails from students and they responded to these five, but not to these three. And right now, um, all I know is that they responded to five, but I don't know which ones they responded to. So that's not good. 
So let me see here. Um, Laura says, uh, oh, and <laughs> thanks, guys, from Maris. They're saying, we agree. <laughs> uh, there's been a discussion in the community about adding some event codes for instructor actions. Yes, I think that would be really, really good. Um, and it's an impossible enhancement opportunity, says Josh, if we could come together on that. And I, I completely agree. I think there are some real opportunities here. Uh, no, there's not an open source version of it, Sam. Good question, but no, uh, had to build it in a proprietary tool that 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 I knew how to do it with. <laughs> All right, Neil. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, let me go ahead and um, reset the clock here, and then we will bring up the next presentation, which is uh, from Marist. And so, Maris, folks, I will give you uh, permissions in just a second here. So let me take it back. Can you go? Yeah, let's we'll see. figure that out. Yeah. Just be a wants second. To you, so. <laughs> the first thing I do is switch to your presentation. Um, Marist, here we go. And then I will find you in the list. Um, so it would be under Edward, right? Yeah, only if you're angry at me. Oh, Ed, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Edward, I, Edward is when we finish the 10 minutes, you say Edward, we will understand. Okay. <laughs> so I'm giving you presenter permissions. Feel free to introduce yourself and go ahead and whenever you start, I'll start the timer. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Ethel Loria. I'm a professor at the School of Computer Science and Mathematics here at Marist College. I'm also the senior data scientist of this uh, project. Ed. My name is Ed Prasuti. I'm the manager of data science, and uh, our job is to help operationalize uh, the research that ITEL does and augment that with our research. So, uh, okay, so we're going to talk about, uh, go back one slide if possible. Yeah, we're going to talk about MUSE, uh, what we call Marist Universal uh, Student Experience, which is a kind of a fancy name. But uh, before we do that, let, let's go uh, to the next slide that uh, kind of tells a little bit about our uh, uh, story of what we have been doing uh, for the last years. We started this uh, a number of years ago with what was, was called the Open Academic Analytics Initiative, a project that was sponsored by EDUCOS through its uh, NGLC grant, and it was funded by the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation. The idea was to create an early alert framework that would allow us to detect students early on in the semester that were uh, at risk of failing or doing poorly in the course. Uh, the twist here was to develop this in a fully open source ecosystem, which is what we did. Well, of course, we are users of Sakai, and then we use a number of other open source tools, namely Weka, which is a um, data mining machine learning tool, something I, I, I would say this early detection framework was based on a machine learning approach. So the project went at the time very well. We received a number of accolades or whatever. At some point, that project uh, turned into becoming the learning analytics processor that became part of Epiria, actually. And uh, over time, we migrated this platform to a uh, um, uh, cluster computing platform based on Hadoop and Spark. We run a number of pilots at a number of institutions and universities in the UK through our partnership with JISC, and we also run uh, uh, a number of pilots at North Carolina State University. Last year, we finally decided to, that it was time to implement this at Marys, so we decided to revamp the platform. We created a learning analytics processor, let's call it version 2, as I said, called it MUSE. And for this, we actually revamped the whole thing, both the ETL stage, the uh, predictive uh, uh, modeling engine that I completely redeveloped. And uh, we put a new face to the project. Now we have a web-based GUI and dashboard that is integrated into Sakai. Uh, Ed is going to talk about that. I'm going to focus on the predictive modeling engine. This predictive modeling engine is based on uh, a stack ensemble of classifiers. Um, a little bit about it. 
uh, can, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Stag Ensemble architecture, as I was saying, is based on this idea that instead of having a single classifier as we used to have before, now we have a collection of classifiers. It's a twist on the traditional concept of an ensemble where what you have is a bunch of classifiers that provide predictions, and then eventually through a majority voting, you come up with a final prediction. Really what we're doing here is substituting majority voting with uh, uh, statistical learning, basically. We have a first stage of base classifiers that delivers predictions, but those predictions are then used as input to a second stage that delivers the final predictions. Uh, this concept was introduced uh, in 1992 by uh, Walpert, um, kind of famous data scientist out there, uh, but it was really never implemented until recently uh, when it surfaced in a number of competitions, uh, KU competitions, and uh, then Netflix award where top contenders were using stacks. I thought it was a very good idea to perhaps bring it to this space, a learning analytics space. There was nothing done on it and definitely not implemented. So we went ahead and actually implemented this. Technically, the issue here is how you implement this without uh, having data leakage and through data leakage inflating the estimates of your predictions. You want to make sure that you don't mess with the uh, data that you're using for training and testing and because you're using it in a kind of uh, disorganized manner you end up with inflated estimates. So what we did was the following. The next slide looks a little terrifying but bear with me for a second. Uh, what we did here is the following. We have a two-stage uh, um, uh, stack ensemble so what we are basically doing is uh, dividing our data in three data sets, what we call data set A, B, and C. Just to be very clear about this, this goes like this. Because we have a two-stack classifier, you need two independent data sets to train and tune the stack. And that's what you see on the left. And then you have a holdout that is a data set that is going to be used to test the, uh, the model. So going a little bit into the details here, the, that uh, um, um, circles in blue represent uh, classifiers, uh, classification algorithms, and the nuggets in uh, yellow represent the trained classifiers. And what we're doing is data set A with the algorithms uh, uh, train the uh, classification models. Then we use those classification models with data set B to produce predictions and probabilities of predictions. We take this data, we uh, put this data inside data set B, that is, we augment data set B. And so we use this augmented data set B with another classification algorithm to produce a second stage classification model. When we finish this stage, we have finished training and tuning our stack. What you see on the right is what we do to test if this works, basically. Just we put data set through the classification, the base classification models that produces predictions. The predictions augment data set C. They go into the second stage classifier and produce the final predictions that uh, um, deliver how good the predictions are going to be. When we have new data, just it's a matter of removing what you see as data set C in the screen, by new data, run it through the stack and produce the final predictions for our students. That's all in all what we're doing. Sounds a little technical, but in reality, it's kind of simple. A few talking points about this before I, I, I pass it to Ed. One thing is um, the uh, classification algorithms that we should use should be algorithms that uh, yield also probabilities because probabilities reinforce predictions. That's very relevant. And they should be very different as much as possible so that they map different hypothesis functions so that we don't get the same predictions from the same classifiers. So generally speaking, you want correlation between predictions to be between 0.75 and 0.8. Uh, 
for the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop here, Pastor Tuet, <laughs> and we're going to be a little beyond time. I hope uh, you're lenient. Um, so I'm going to walk through the, the implementation. I'll, I'll go through this really quickly so we can get your questions. But basically, what we needed to do was aggregate data, populate a, a primary warehouse, transform the data, um, and then make that available to feed the stack classifiers that I tell just described. Um, yeah, if we could have an extra minute or two, that would be great. Um, so what we did was, in order to facilitate that, was not just leverage iLearn data, but also leverage uh, student information system data. So we have LMS data and uh, and SMS data as well. And what we do is aggregate that through a set of servers that then prepare that unit of analysis for feeding into the model. Um, what you're looking at right here, this is the LTI interface to Sakai. Uh, and you'll see some, some black circles. I'm going to get a little bit closer on that. Um, and th those represent, each one of these bubbles represents an individual student. And this is what the professor would see, so that they can see what's going on with students in their class. And if there's a black circle around it, there was not sufficient data to make a uh, prediction. So what we do is base that on a past uh, academic performance. Um, the other thing that we provide is aggregation of activity by week. Now, this goes back to some of the stuff that the LAMP guys were doing, where you're pulling these event data out of, um, where you're pulling event data out of iLearn. This is a reflection of what that looks like on a week by week basis. And then the student view actually shows what's going on with the student. Now, I'm not breaking student confidentiality. Uh, Jim Bridenstine is actually uh, a congressman from the first congressional district in the state of Colorado. So uh, we're looking at live data with somebody else's name on it. So basically what we have is, is a view into the student, whether they're at risk, what their activity looks like during the week, and we'll go on to questions. Cool. So I'll reset. I'll reset the clock for the questions. Then. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yes, we actually contributed back. This is a, a Perio's uh, open dashboard. So uh, we contributed back the JDBC data or JDBC interface to our databases. Back to that. Um, currently, the Muse interface has not been contributed back. Um, it's a little bit custom to our institution, so we're looking at making that a little bit more general so that we can contribute that back to the Open Dashboard community as well. Uh, yeah, Didi points out I learned equals Sakai. So yeah, that's correct. We, yeah, yeah, we mentioned I learned, but we've called it Sakai as I learned internally here at Mary's. So. So I, I, guess have question, was, I have a question on the, the is the, the analytic engine in um, the latest Aperio LRW, is that different from the analytic engine you're using here with Muse? Uh, the latest Aperio engine, to the best of my knowledge, is a logistic regression model. Um, so this this newer version is is a little fancier than that, much more fancy than that. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is different. It is different, and one a couple of things. We haven't put up here a slide with uh, uh, performance metrics. We just published a paper with extensive uh, uh, empirical results that we can share with the community if you're interested. Uh, we run extensive results. Two results that are relevant to mention is that when you put a stack to play, uh, uh, experimentally, it shows that the stack as a whole supersedes the performance of the individual classifiers, which is what we are interested in doing. But even more important than that, it shapes variability among uh, uh, the different classifiers, which is something that typically haunts any uh, uh, predictive modeling project because you expose a classifier to different data sets, the incoming data, and sometimes you get varying results depending on the classifier 
classifier that you're using. If you're using something like logistic regression that has kind of a low variance, that doesn't happen as much, but it does happen. The good thing about putting a stack into play is that that variability in the results gets shaven away, really. Uh, the question about uh, faculty, we ran our second pilot for the spring. It's been very well received. Uh, some interesting takeaways from that is we're finding the faculty using it to really demonstrate uh, statistics on or to evaluate the statistics on student performance, which we thought was very interesting. Uh, what we are finding also is that even though we're telling them it's a prediction, they're interpreting it sometimes as this is what it's going to be. So uh, we get some feedback on the accuracy, which basically says we're trying to predict the future. So it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to um, explain that, but we'll be going through that in the next. We're not exposing the predictions to the uh, students. We are doing it uh, through the faculties that are acting as proxy. And the reason is very tied to Marist in particular. Marist has only 5% of students at risk in any given semester, which means that our tool that at this point is kind of highly performant is able to detect 90% or, or close to 90% of the uh, uh, students that are actually at risk. But that's 90% of the 5%, a little less than 90%, but let's round it at 90%. On the other hand, we're producing between 10 and 13% of false alarms, which in our community that has 95% of students, okay, it's going to generate at least uh, at five or percent of students at risk uh, of false alarms. So we want to make sure that we funnel this through the faculty members that will detect the false alarms easily because they know the students, but uh, it will not affect, of course, any kind of generalized panic among the student population. Huh? Uh, Martin, yeah, yeah, it is the uh, minority report effect. Um, Jesse, uh, basically the input data is a combination of uh, sort of biographic data and I learned, or uh, I'm sorry, Sakai uh, event data that's uh, broken down into sort of the bar charts that we expressed. We don't have a published doc for it, but uh, we are going to be doing that. And no, we are not presenting at the Aperio conference to the best of my knowledge currently. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, pre uh, time is up on that part and really appreciate the uh, presentation there. I'm going to go ahead and reset the clock for 10 minutes. Uh, and then I believe we want to do screen sharing with uh, Zai Jing. Is that, I'm not sure if you're yes. pronouncing your name right. Yeah. OK. So I'm passing that presenter over to presenter option over to you. And please feel free to introduce yourself. I know it's going to take a minute or so to uh, get the screen sharing going there. In the meantime, if there's any additional questions uh, that folks have, we can maybe have uh, the presenters entertain those while we're waiting. So uh, to a question for Maris. So the, the enhanced analytics engine, will you be contributing that back to Aperio? Um, yes, we could. Uh, uh, this is coded in R. We, we, we code the, the, well, actually, I coded the whole thing in R, basically. So, uh, and it's basically uh, using a bunch of libraries out there that we put together. We coded the framework ourselves, basically. We decided not to use any framework that there are a couple of frameworks that develop a stack we decided not to do that to control the situation in a better manner uh, but we're using a bunch of well-known open source uh, 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 packages out there that come out of ours so we can easily contribute that yeah right great so i see that the screen sharing is now available um so if you uh this is now the notre dame presentation please uh, feel free to start whenever you would like and introduce yourself and yeah. um, your subject. Great. I'm Pat Miller. Uh, I am Xia Jingduan. And uh, we're we're kind of going back down to earth right now. <laughs> we're we're not. Uh, we've implemented the Open LR uh, LRS 
and are hoping to implement the entire open LRW. However, we're not yet uh, quite ready and we're not to the predictive stage for sure. So what we thought we'd do is kind of look at how we're using the current LRW, LRS for some practical learning analytics. And we're focusing on our pilot, which was with the Notre Dame first year experience. And just to give you a little background, it's a, a new program that was started uh, two and a half years ago. It's a two course sequence required of all the first year students. So you're talking about about 2,100 students who have to take this course. It's uh, organized into over a hundred sections of about 20 students each. And uh, it's, um, uh, it's meant to kind of bring someone into the Notre Dame community with its, our philosophy of education, its co-curricular. Um, it uh, ties, there's a lot of uh, reflection that is done within the course. And you'll see how we uh, take a look at those uh, uh, the, the various uh, reflection assignments that students are given. So with that, we'll go on to Zhao Zhen. Sure. Uh, thanks, Pat. So I'd like to start with uh, uh, learning analytics visualizations we created for the Monroe Program Director. Like um, this blue line shows uh, all the uh, over 2,000 Monroe students log in activity to the course from the January from the start of the course to last Friday. And this orange line shows the, all the students click activity on all the course resources from the beginning of the semester to last Friday. And uh, we see a, a low point here uh, on the March 11th, that's the uh, spring break week. And uh, the bar chart below here shows the total number of clicks that each of the course resources had so far. And uh, this pink dashed line is just a reference line of the total number of the Moreau students, 2050. It shows us which course resources were not clicked by all the students. This information are very helpful to help improve the course design. As we can see, some of the career development related course resources didn't make make it to the reference line. Maybe it's because for the first year students, career development planning is not so high on their list. And we see the most clicked resources so far are from the week four. And the week four started on February 11th. So this correlated with the, the spikes on the students logging and the clicked activities on the chart above. And because each of the Monroe section is uh, taught by a different instructor, so the great inconsistency can be a potential issue. To help address that issue, and we created this uh, uh, assignment score dashboard for the program director. Uh, this bar chart here shows the average scores of each assignment throughout the entire 114 sections, except for the integration three assignment, which has a maximum score of 200. And all the rest of the assignments have a maximum score of 20. And this is a box plot of all the sections average score for each individual assignment. One thing stands out here is a section 78. And for the ePortfolio link assignment, the average score is 25.26. It's above the maximum score, what's going on. And from the uh, detailed score description, uh, de detailed score distribution chart here, we see 20, uh, 14 students scored 20 for this assignment in this section, but five students scored 40 for this assignment. It turns out the score 40 was sim simply an uh, instructor error. She or she put the score in the wrong column in the uh, test and quizzes to in Sakai. So this kind this is kind of issues a program director hope to catch and address early so the instructor so the students can have an average uh, scores for their assignment. Another outlier here is uh, for section 23. This is the average score for 20 section 3 for this ePortfolio link assignment is zero. And it turns out 
nine, 19 students scored zero. So everybody scored zero. It's because the instructor didn't grade the assignment yet. This is another issue the program director is concerned of, how to make sure the instructors to grade the assignments in a timely manner. In a timely manner. Uh, in order to help the address this issue, we created this weekly grading nudge report. And to help the program director identify those sections which didn't grade assignments on time. For example, this report on the left here shows by February 23rd, there were 21 sections lacking grades. So the program director contacted those instructors and it reminds them to put grades in the sky. And by, we can see by March the 2nd, five sections lacked grades. And by last Friday, March 23rd, there were only one section lack grade. We can see a big improvement here. And one thing I, I'd like to point out is uh, due to the program director's magic, no instructors felt offended by her nudging along. And the next, I'd like to share what kind of realizations we can provide to the instructors. This tree map here shows section seven students total click on all the course resources so far. And the dark color and the bigger the square, each square represents a student. And the darker color and the bigger the square is, the more clicks that student had. And the detailed, you know, and the uh, heat map below here shows, gives the instructor a detailed look on who clicked on what resources. For example, the instructor can click on, on this square on this, um, to find out which resources this student didn't click. It turns out this student didn't click on the, any of the resources in week four and week five. It's the same with the um, video resources. This packed bubble chart shows the, the total um, length of videos each student consumed in that section. And the detailed um, heat, sorry, uh, heat map here shows the average view rate each student had on each of the videos. And another interesting observ observation from this heat map is uh, the shorter the video is, this number represents the length of the video. The shorter the video is, the higher average re uh, view rate those videos had. I guess that's another uh, course design rule approved by many other studies. And next, uh, I'd like to share how we use the learning analytics to help with the students who are potentially at risk. It's a process involved identify, notify, boost, and evaluate. First, we identified 39 students who missed two or more assignments in the first six weeks. By missing, I mean those students either didn't submit for those assignments or they scored a zero for those assignments. After we got that list, the program director uh, sent out an email to those students. It's a very carefully designed email and uh, tell, telling the students you might be showing some signs of struggling. And we want, we strive to be as transparent as possible we tell the students, you are one of the only 39 students who, did, who missed two or more assignments. And we also send out a Qualtrics survey to get more information from the students on why they were lacking behind in the assignments. And based on the specific reasons, we provide them the personalized actions to take. This is a early boosting opportunities to help the students get back on track. And after mid-semester, uh, mid by mid-semester, we identified the students whose midterm uh, was, below, uh, was below B. And uh, we shared those reports with the course advisors. And we let the advisors know the, those students, uh, uh, the scores for each assignment, and also the average scores throughout the entire program. So the advisors can have a more data-driven discussion with those students to help them get back on track. The last step is to evaluate the effect effectiveness of the entire uh, boosting process. Our main identifier is the 
students' grades movement from the midterm to the final. So in general, 44 out of 50, 52 students who received a midterm boost improved their moral grades by at least one letter grade. A detailed example would be like three students improved from D to A minus. And this chart on the right shows the each individual student's grade movement from midterm to final. And uh, this is uh, encouraging. We think it's uh, our boasting is effective. That's all what we have for today. Okay. If you have any okay. questions. Perfect. So there are there is at least one question in the chat, I see. Do you guys see the chat? Yes. Yeah, there's one from Jesse. Around um, click number does a click number correlate well to students' performance, or maybe spent uh, time spent will be better an indicator. Yes, uh, uh, for the for the reading materials, it's hard to collect the the data on how long how much the students spent on reading those materials. Right, right. Yeah, but I mean, the only data we have, yeah. yeah. With video, we can actually see the time spent, but with, uh, you know, with um, reading material, it's very yeah. difficult. We don't have the data, so. Yeah, if you have uh, any <laughs> method to collect that data, we would be very happy to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, our data is being collected multiple ways. One is through our LRS, in which the um, uh, XAPI, event data is sent to the learning record store mm -hmm. uh, but we also supplement that with feeds from the gradebook right we're, we're using a direct uh link to the sakai gradebook um uh, through you know using the um, mysql database and getting uh the grades from there mm -hmm. in in real time yes or near real time yes mm -hmm. You compare midterm to final score improvements. Um, uh, well, yeah, last actually the first year we did do some analysis, um, and uh, the you know the nudging was very successful. Um, of course, this year we're not sure what the uh, we don't have the final scores yet, but we mm -hmm. certainly will be looking at that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jesse's question, what's the XAPI profile for XAPI? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Yeah. Uh, we're getting our XAPI directly from the um, XAPI provider in Sakai. We, we have actually done some enhancements. We were not getting some events early on. We're now getting more events than yeah. we did originally. Ah, okay. Yeah, the uh, right. Right now, of course, Sakai is not does not um, send caliper. Yeah. However, um, however, in the LRS, well, actually, in the new version, the LRW, the XAPI are converted to caliper. Mm. And you know, we're hoping to start. Uh, we're hoping to go into production with the LRW which now takes multiple feeds from XAPI sources as well as caliper sources, mm -hmm. which will allow us to have a better integration you know, with, with other third-party tools. Mm Yeah, so I mean, we we rely on whatever the XAPI provider in Sakai gives us in terms of the the data. Any other questions? Ah, uh, good question on on. Instructors now in in the now the nice thing about our pilot with the first year of studies is they required all their instructors to use the grade book. However, uh, yeah, you're right. There are a lot of uh, other uh, 
other faculty who don't necessarily use the grade book. Uh, all we can do is try to nudge them toward using the grade book. We're, we're hoping that with the new grade book, we can get more usage. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, the nice thing about the Moreau program, it, it was a controlled environment. And we had very, you know, pretty strict requirements as to the content, the, even the videos. Um, and it was a flipped course also. Most of the reading and video watching was done outside of the actual class time. Right, yeah, as Laura is pointing out, the sites were all set up identically. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our presenters very much. And um, let me get the little bells ringing here. It occurred to me kind of listening to these, there are like three different models of, um, of how people are using analytics and different technologies they're using them. And um, it also occurred to me like there's so, I wonder how you compare how people are, are using uh, and employing analytics, right? There's the use cases, what you're trying to achieve, the objectives, there's the communications pieces, there's the technology pieces underneath them. Um, just pretty fascinating. Um, I know that within the uh, group that was talking about this presentation, and we have just a few minutes left, um, there was some discussion around wanting to get input from the community. Um, and I realized it might be hard to absorb and seeing three different models and trying to absorb what those models uh, meant, but I'm curious if anyone has any comments or thought, thought processes around sort of how to keep the discussion around analytics going for the last couple of minutes here. And I see that uh, Ed says his focus is uh, early detection to promote student success. And I think uh, the LAMP focus was more around, Martin, around um, encouraging instructor activity, right? That's exactly right. It's making sure that instructors are engaged with their students, particularly in a distance ed setting. Yeah. And then for Notre Dame, what would you care? How would you characterize in like a sentence what the main purpose is? Is it in sort of intervention for the student to help them be more successful? Right. Right. Yeah. I think um, we're basically trying to boost um, student success and helping them to thrive. But we're also you know, trying to get instructors to uh, improve their their methods and their, you know, timeliness. And Martin Roots uh, writes, our focus is on instructor engagement during a course they're teaching, particularly online courses. <laughs> Yeah, the, the recording will, of this will be on the Aperio YouTube channel. Um, it'll be up there within probably just a couple days. Um, so thanks all. And, you know, please, please give us some consideration about like what your institution is doing, what your needs are, if there's some value in uh, sharing this information in this way or having other types of conversations. Um, and uh, Xia Jing says our focus is on boosting students and instructors. Cool. Any any final words from the presenters or from any of the participants? Uh, yeah, I think uh, there is a lot of value because I think that in a way we complement each other in, in the in the way in which uh, we are working. Our focus is early detection, uh, and we enrich early detection with uh, a number of. of, of of uh, let's say visuals that come from activity data but the other presenters perhaps are focusing on other areas also tied to activity data and definitely have a more sophisticated view because that's their focus so it, it would be really interesting to see if we were able to come together in a call or something like that to try to see how we can perhaps interchange some ideas and how we can draw from your experience and perhaps get something into our own fold and you do the same with whatever we are doing basically because I think that uh, the focuses are different and uh, the fact that the focuses are different are going to kind of guarantee that we're going to be able to enrich whatever we're doing at each of our locations. Yes, I agree. 
Very cool. <laughs> well, thank you all. I see a final thing there from Jesse, uh, um, an invitation to consider joining a special interest group, a SIG, in the IEEE uh, called Icicle API and the Learning Analytics SIG. So, and um, Jesse has a link there. So very cool. And of course, Aperio has, as everyone knows, has some uh, uh, open source oh. initiatives that we talked to more referenced here too. Oh yeah, and, um, I didn't know that there was a SIG in learning analytics. That would actually be a very good idea because that that probably even um, kind of uh, opens up this to a larger community in a way. No? Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, I think that's a good good point. So I see we're about out of time. So I want to thank all the presenters again. Thank all everyone who asked questions, and um, the recording will be available soon. So thank you all, and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.